And uh, I'm sorry, I don't have that today because I'm in California, but I got to tell a story. So Dr. Bozak, your, your question or your, your comment about the enthusiasm of people, you know, reaching out to you. So I chair a different a committee on financial services, the banking subcommittee, and I was getting interviewed uh, by the Wall Street Journal just as Perseverance was landing uh, a month or two ago, whenever it was. And I couldn't talk about banking. All I could talk about with this guy from the Wall Street Journal was the Perseverance landing. And it's because I was so excited about it. And I am excited about the um, efforts and the successes uh, that you've had so far. And, and Dr. Babin, you know, I mean, you, a lot of times you can't have success without, you know, a few trials and errors. And we've had those too. Uh, but this one seems to be, you know, each each time you try something, ingenuity, it took you, you know, reprogramming it a little bit before it could take off. Um, you know, the cameras, uh, Dr. Beagle, seem to be working fantastic. Uh, we haven't quite tried the drilling yet, I don't think. Uh, but, you know, you're taking these one step at a time. So I want to talk about moxie and I want to talk about ingenuity if if I could. and. And so explain to me the, the process, what's going on with Moxie as, as we're, we're figuring out how to create oxygen on this planet, which will benefit us, you know, in, in many different ways. And I just open all of these questions to all the panelists. So jump in as you choose, Dr. Beagle. So I can, I can explain what's going on with Moxie. And Moxie had, did a run the other night where they take CO2 out of the atmosphere and they turn that CO2 into breathable oxygen um, or oxygen that could be used for uh, rocket fuel. Um, uh, they, uh, um, they run overnight. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful instrument, and they created uh, enough that you could breathe on Mars for 10 minutes, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but really is, it's the start of that whole process. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating instrument. Anybody else want to talk about MOXIE, and then we'll get to ingenuity? Okay. It's okay. What I what what I would like to mention is, is that uh, the way it does is it splits the molecule, so it strips the two oxygens off of the carbon, and that's how it's generating the oxygen. So it's it's kind of a a neat process. It takes a catalytic converter, but it's a uh, it's it's a test, and the volume depends on how big of a thing you want to use. Great, the old catalytic converter. That's that's amazing. So. Um, Dr. Meyer, do you see this as sort of a precursor of some kind of bigger uh, system that would then, you know, enable our, if, if, so I am a big proponent of human uh, space exploration and, and hope to see our astronauts on Mars by 2033, and I wish I had my bumper sticker for you, but I don't. Um, do you see this as something that will, uh, we could put together to really provide oxygen for our astronauts or for fuel. I mean, in it, so, you know, a massive kind of uh, approach to this. So, so how I see the real advantage is, is that you can put a system for like MOXIE onto the surface of Mars and have it operating for years and then send humans or then send your return spacecraft and you can make use of that oxygen that has been generated. You know, one of the things to keep in, in mind is that rocket fuel is an oxidant and a reductant. So like something like methane or ethanol and then the oxygen. Well, the oxygen is actually the heavier part. So this this goes a long way in making getting to the surface of Mars with something you can return it. If you make most of the mass of your fuel on the planet itself, it's it's a huge advantage. Great. Uh, to the geologists, um, how are you going to use ingenuity to help you uh, explore a little bit of the geology up there? I guess I'll, I'll start and then hand it over to Professor Bozek. So, uh, you know, ingenuity is a technology demonstration. You know, it wasn't even originally part of the mission, but I think that is part of the reason that we explore and that is part of the reason the US space program is so outstanding is that we dare to do audacious things like fly a helicopter on another planet. <laughs> like, wow. And you know what? We figured out how to do it. It worked. 
And so ingenuity is, is going to, you know, on its final flight, scout out some of the terrain around us, we hope, getting a closer view than what we have from orbit. But what is, I think, super important is how it paves the way for future exploration technologies. There are already folks at JPL who are talking about, well, you know, what if instead of carrying a tiny little 500 gram cell phone camera, could we put five kilograms of science payload on there so we could fly down the canyons of Mars from spot to spot, taking images, making chemical measurements? So I think what's important about Ingenuity is it's paving the path for future exploration. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I love this stuff. I yield back. <laughs> uh, thanks, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Yeah, and he sent me that book and I'm trying to wade through it. It's a pretty heavy math book, but um, he's trying to educate us as part of this uh, subcommittee. So Dr. Meyer, let me start with you. Uh, when I was uh, talking to Dr. Uh, Elman about uh, ingenuity, she said it was an audacious addition to the uh, project. So how, and, and for, the, for the others, how do you get your experiments you know, once you've decided we're going to send another rover up to Mars, I mean, how does Dr. Bozak get her experiment on your on on the trip? So let me start with you, and then I'd like to hear from their side how they managed <laughs> yeah. their their experiments uh, as part of the whole process. Yeah, I, well, I'll put it this way: it's quite a gauntlet in terms of uh, what's needed. But as we've done for Curiosity, and we also did for Pers Perseverance, we put a call out that says we're going to send a mission to Mars. This is what the goal is. Send us your proposal for an instrument, and we'll see how it all fits together. And so it, it very much is open competition for people to propose whatever they think is applicable to the goal, right? Uh, and very rigorous competition. It, it is, um, it, it's actually very hard to go through the whole process. And then you have to choose, you have to narrow it down to those things that will fit on the mission from all the excellent proposals that you receive. And, and then there's a little bit of a give and take where you don't want to send two of the same instrument. You want to make sure they complement each other. You want to make sure one instrument doesn't use all the resources on the mission. So there's, there's a little bit of making sure they fit well together. But, but the real process is individuals, obviously uh, experienced and having a whole team behind them, uh, proposing what they think would be the best instrument, and, uh, and then the whole review process to select that. And, and that's been extremely successful so far. Great. Dr. Bozak, how did you get involved with this project? I answered one of these proposal calls uh, when all the instruments already had been selected and really advanced in the works to get on the rover. Uh, there was a proposal call by the Mars program to select participating sample scientists. And they were looking for people who actually work on samples in laboratories because they wanted to ensure that people who that people think about how to collect a sample, how to orient a sample. And uh, there is a diverse team of us who were selected. So we wrote proposals about what we could do with these samples and how we would take notes to document and tell people why we selected certain samples. Great. Dr. Beagle, how did Sherlock become part of this? It's a pretty simple process. Back in the mid 90s, we um, started thinking about ideas on how to send something to Mars to look for life. You write a proposal, you write more proposal, you write another proposal. You have to go in and do the scientific rationale behind what measurement you're going to do. At the same time, you're doing the engineering to show that you can actually do it. So a lot of instruments that fail on one of those two things because it's a very complex environment scientifically to make a measurement. And it's a very complex environment um, from a, a temperature, pressure, radiation, and everything else that you have to show vibrations, um, that you have to get your technology to work. Uh, you write a bunch of proposals, you write a bunch of papers, you get scientific buy-in. And then in 2012, we knew that there was going to be an announcement of opportunity. We spent a year writing the proposal. We submitted the proposal. The proposal got accepted. There were 58 different concepts that went into that call. And we were one of seven that got selected. And then the fun really begins where you actually have to build your instrument that's the size of a room 
down to the size of a shoebox uh, and show that it works. Um, it's a it's a fun process. <laughs> well, it sounds you know, starting in the '90s, it sounded like you were able to perfect it over a period of time. So, thank you, Dr. Elman. What about you? I guess we'll talk about something that people uh, don't always talk about, which is kind of the, the failure aspect of uh, instrument proposals or not failures, but lack of lack of selection. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm privileged to be part of two extraordinary instruments, one led by Dr. Beagle, part of his team, and then Jim Bell at Arizona State, part of his team. I also led a team that proposed an instrument, one of the 58 to the rover. We ranked category one, which is as high as you can possibly rank. But in the end, we weren't selected reasons of balance, reasons of, but this is where as scientists we compete and then we collaborate and we do both simultaneously and that's what brings the best ideas to the forefront. I've gone through this process again, a different mission, different competition, different call, one of NASA's small sat competitions. And I'm the principal investigator of Lunar Trailblazer, a small satellite going to the moon that will map its water. So it's a process. Sometimes you win, sometimes you don't, but you keep going forward to do the best science and bring the best instruments and missions to light. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Uh, Congressman Perlmutter, thank you so much.